USA Warrior Stories is a not-for-profit organization designed to record, archive, and share videos of veteran stories to help veterans make a connection with one another and to help us all better understand their sacrifices for our freedoms. My father heard about the Navy ROTC scholarship program uh, and he told me that I was going to go take the ROTC scholarship test, much like the SATs. Unfortunately, on that particular day, I had other plans. My father corrected me and he said, you're going to take this test. I went into the test with a, a little bit of a bad attitude and I said, well, no, wait a minute, Let, let's, let's be realistic here. Long story short, I did well on the Navy ROTC uh, you know, test. And from there, the conversation was, what do you really want to do in the Navy? And I, uh, I stumbled across underwater demolition. And I said, you know, that, that looks like something that I would really like to do. The SEALs were formed in 1962, and nobody really knew about it back then when President Kennedy established the SEALs. As I came to find a little bit more about underwater demolition, the word SEAL popped up here, and there was a Reader's Digest story about the SEALs, and I said, you know, that might be the, the best way that I could serve, serve our country. You'll be exposed to pain and punishment and other little devices that we'll think of for one reason and one reason only, to make you the type of person we need to get the job done, no matter what the job is. SEAL training, we don't have the time for me to describe how difficult it is. They push you to mental fatigue. They push you to physical fatigue. When you're fatigued like that, what gets you through? It's here. Everything from the neck down is a life support system for the brain housing group. This is what gets you through training. Because when you're in war, when, when we were being shot to crap on a rice paddy over there in Vietnam, there's no timeouts. There's no, oh, gee, my ankle, my butt, my, you can't stop. You have got to continue to press. We completed basic training. Uh, it was called SEAL Basic Indoctrination at SEAL Team 1 back then. I got my uh, Naval Special Warfare device, and then we went into a pre-deployment training uh, you know, program uh, where we had input from recently returned Vietnam vets who really prepared us very well for what we were going to encounter when we got to Vietnam. The practice then was uh, you get to Vietnam. We were down in a place uh, called uh, Sea Float. It was, a, it was a bunch of barges in the Kulan River down in, in the lower part of Four Corps. And the practice then was the platoon that you were replacing would take you on a, quote, break-in mission. The first mission was uh, set up uh, so it was maybe there might be, uh, might be contact. It was a mission that was designed for success. In an age when most military engagements have become distant and impersonal, SEALs operate in the midst of the enemy. Their purpose is to disrupt his supply lines, choke his communications, learn his secrets. There were any number of uh, rather hairy or difficult uh, you know, missions that, uh, that we were on. One in particular, we had gone up this river and we had uh, interdicted a uh, suspected uh, VC sympathizer who attempted to, uh, to get away from us and we got some documents from, uh, from the body. And we're returning back down the river, we got ambushed. Now, the Vietnamese uh, out in the countryside use something that they call sampans. It's like an American canoe. Many of the Vietnamese were small stature, lightweight. I was 220 pounds in my birthday suit before I picked up my gun, the grenades, the ammunition, etc. So I'm pushing 300 pounds when I get into that sampan. All of a sudden, what was a three-man sampan is now a one Tom Richards sampan. So we had to get larger sampans in order for us to do our thing. We're paddling back down the river and we get ambushed. In this one particular sampan was myself, and a, uh, another automatic weaponsman. They shot those sampans full of holes. Don and I are in that sampan as the sampan is gradually sinking below the surface of the water. I don't know how we didn't get hit when that sampan was shot full of holes, but we didn't. 
So we're shooting until our elbows are basically in the water. We roll out of the sampan away from the direction that we were receiving fire. Because of the weight of the uh, ammunition and weapons that we were carrying, we walked across the bottom of the river to the other side of the river, got out of the river, poured the water out of the rifle barrels, because if you, if you try to shoot uh, around into a, a barrel full of water, it's, it, it, the gas is just gonna explode the barrel and you know, it come it back into your face, et cetera. Pour the water out of our barrels and resume shooting at the, at the bad guys on the other side of the river. How many people do you think have the training and presence of mind to roll out of that sampan, shot full of holes, roll out, walk to the, uh, to the opposite bank and do what we did, pour the, pour the uh, water out of our barrels. Presence of, of mind, understanding of the, uh, of, of the situation, and we're not out of this fight until the enemy is, is uh, you know, run away and gone, or they're, or they're uh, dead, unable to, uh, unable to shoot back at us, and the rest of our teammates are safe. I would venture to say that there's not a whole, there's not a long list of people who would do what Don and I did that particular day. Uh, but that is a testimony to the training that we had, to the, uh, to the confidence that we had in our own abilities, to our presence of mind and uh, being at home in the maritime environment. The 30th of January, 1971, was a real bad day at Black Rock. Uh, that's the day that uh, uh, five members of Zulu platoon got wounded on a, uh, on a mission. I was in the process of pulling some of my, uh, some of my teammates out of, a, uh, out of an ambush kill zone when I got shot in the hand. And uh, I described being shot in the hand, uh, the feeling of telling somebody, go ahead and put your hand on an anvil and then ask your buddy to, uh, to swing that five pound sledge and, and hit, you on the, uh, hit you on the hand. That's about what it felt like. And the hand is now uh, like some fresh ground, uh, you know, uh, a hamburger, you know, red. There's a lot of, you know, you know, blood coming out of there. And I look down at my hand and I see what I thought was the bullet sticking out of the back of my hand. Now, we've all seen John Wayne or uh, Clint Eastwood, you know, was it two mules from Sister Sarah? You know, pulls the arrow out of the back of his hand. So I said, okay, I reached down, grabbed what I thought was a bullet, and pulled. It was one of my finger bones. It was still attached. If I thought it hurt when I first got shot, I will tell you that my frickin' toes curled when I went to pull on that bullet. And I said, Jesus Christ, we'll worry about that later. I literally, you know, forgot about the wound at that point in time. I I went about doing what I doing what I could to uh, to, to to save my uh, my fellow platoon members, and uh, you know we you know we thankfully managed to get out of there alive. And I uh, I give a lot of thanks to whatever happened in the universe that day to allow me to survive. But that wound was uh, was incredible. The bullet went through the end of my thumb, to the end of my finger. Through the uh, through my hand, and you can see the, uh, the the finger still doesn't work right, and I got a lump on the back of my hand. But it's always a conversation stopper when I show show somebody my war wound. I thought that I had done a pretty good job uh, in that deployment to uh, to Vietnam. I felt that I performed fairly well under uh, uh, under those circumstances. I said I can do this. This is what I'm meant to do. This is what I want to do. When I was when I was told it. I was not going to be able to go over in, a, in another platoon. Uh, that that stopped me in my tracks. I said, "Okay, geez, what I, what do I want to do?" In the course of my 30 years, and in the course of a, uh, a SEAL officer or enlisted, they may not be in a SEAL team or at the SEAL training unit or at a naval special warfare group, but every assignment that they have is going to be associated with the teams. You know, I, I was an instructor, then I went to something called Defense Intelligence School. When we got shot the crap on the, uh, 
you know, 30th of January in 71, there was an intelligence failure. And I said to myself, that is not going to happen to me again. So I went to Defense Intelligence School and I ended up with a subspecialty in intelligence. And I was assigned as an intelligence officer to a naval special warfare group. So I was supporting the SEAL teams. After that, I had, the, I had a, a real exceptional opportunity. Uh, and that was to go to something that was called the Chief of Naval Operations Strategic Study Group. The Navy selected uh, a handful of officers from different warfare specialties, aviators, submariners, surface warfare, naval special warfare, to go to Newport, Rhode Island, and the Chief of Naval Operations at the time would provide a particular topic uh, that he wanted us to look at. And it was something that would be looking forward to, uh, to help shape the Navy and, uh, and policy as we, as we move forward. It was an incredible opportunity. Uh, we got to talk to uh, uh, commanders in chiefs of each of the uh, you know, you know, regions around the world, you know, you know Sink Pack, Sink Your, Sink South, all those. Uh, and I, I believe we actually did get to meet each and every one of those four-star commanders, some of the things that we asked those individuals was, what's the hot item on your plate today? What are you, what, what are you dealing with today? And we'd look at how that uh, would reflect back on the task that we got from the, uh, from the Chief of, Op uh, of Naval Operations and, and, and try to tie that together. I was the first Navy SEAL to be commander of something we refer to as a Theater Special Operations Command, and that was a Theater Special Operations Commander for um, U.S. forces at the Atlantic Command. Then I moved on to take command of Naval Special Warfare uh, for, uh, for three and a half years. I had about 6,000 people in, in the command. I looked at life like I worked for those 6,000 people. And in the course of any of the accomplishments we had when I was a commander of, uh, of Naval Special Warfare, I, I owe it to the, uh, to, to the staff. I like to think that I was smart enough to recognize the contribution of others. A military individual gets a mission, their job is to complete this mission. I don't care what fucking time it is. I'm gonna do the goddamn job. Many folks in the civilian community are working nine to five. Some singer made a whole lot of money with a song about that. They're working nine to five, and then they're pulling chocks, they're done. The military member, the special operations, Army, Navy, Air Force, or Marine, special operations person is going to finish the job. So if you're hiring, you want that individual who's going to look at that job, figure out how to get it done. And oh, by the way, they're good at working with people because one person doesn't complete the special operations mission. You take the input from the weapons specialist, from the communications guy, from the intelligence person to put together your whole plan. So we're willing to look to somebody else for an answer and a specialty we don't have. It's, it's not going to hurt our ego to uh, say, hey, uh, I, I need this. We're going to put together the plan. We're going to figure it out and we're going to get the, be the best people to do that. If you're looking to hire, you want to you wanna find that successful military person, officer or, uh, or enlisted. And let me use a term called PTS. If you'll notice, I didn't say PTSD. I've been to places, you know, the former president used to call some of the shithole countries around the world. We do not appreciate what we have here in the United States. I mentioned earlier that when I was shot in the hand, I, I looked down at a, uh, uh, you know, a pound of hamburger with some, uh, some crap sticking out of it, right? That hurt. I had guys who were shot in the groin, shot through the chest, you know, you know blood, uh, blood leaking out of these guys. You know, you don't, you don't forget that. But to call it post-traumatic stress disorder is the wrong answer. It's post-traumatic stress. If it didn't bother you, that would be a disorder. And so I, I really hate when I hear PTSD, no. I don't think about it often. I tell my wife I don't have post-traumatic stress. I have had stressful situations in my life. I think I've dealt with them uh, you know, fairly well. Uh, I think it's the Eagles have a song called Get Over It. That's who I am. Get over it. 
move on to the uh, to the next uh, you know, next part of life. But when when you've had people watch their teammates that they've spent their last six months or six years with get blown apart by a mortar round or blown apart by an IED, if there's not some fucking stress associated with that, I don't know what's going to happen in your life that is not stressful.